Hello, this is Evan Schwartz, and this is a Milestone 3 screencast for Battlecry. Uh, we're going to do the same thing we were doing the last few weeks. We're going to record through my iPhone uh, activities on my Android tablet, uh, go through it on the iPhone, and then re-record the recording so that you guys can hear it. Uh, so we'll get started on the Android tablet um, this week under Milestone 3. Uh, one of the things that uh, was sort of backlog we threw uh, into the mix was the ability to try to initiate permissions around the microphone prior to getting into the game when the mechanic is needed for an activity in the game. Um, both Android and iPhone have their eccentricities around it. One of the... Um, issues that I have with Android is that uh, there's no way to capture or tie into what the user is doing from the permissions dialog. Uh, so there's no way for it to notify me what the, what the user did. So it becomes a little bit clunky. Um, I've turned it off. So that's one of the benefits here on Android also, so we'll talk about the good things and the bad things, is that I can go into the settings and disable microphone and that's good enough for my app to prompt you again. So it's a little bit easier to test this on the Android. So we'll go ahead and do login. And you'll see that it's prompting me. I have an option to do not ask again. Um, you'll see why I'm pointing that out when we get to the iPhone. So I'm going to hit deny. And at that point it just goes back to the screen. As you know, I or as I just said, you, I don't know that they hit deny. I just know that I then tried to get to the microphone. Um, I was unable to do a micro recording. Therefore, the assumption is that they denied it. So there's, there's some assuming I'm having to do based on side effects as to whether or not they allowed it or denied it. So if I go back in, uh, it prompts again because I didn't check the box and I can say allow this time. Now again, at this point, because it's out of process, I've allowed it. But again, the application underneath doesn't know that I've allowed it. And the timing, because it's an out-of-process prompt, um, the application has already gone through and tried to access the microphone prior to the operator hitting allow. So then it just goes back to the menu. So on the next through, it's now allowed. It does its micro recording. It can detect that the microphone is viable and everything's good and goes in. So that's really kind of the best user experience uh, that I could produce given the fact that I have no way to um, bind or have a callback or some sort of notification from the Android tablet as to what the user and operator has done. All right, so we've made quite a few um, changes here in Milestone 3, including uh, activities on the friend list. So you can now actively uh, unfriend people, friend people uh, throughout the various lists if you're not already friends with them. And if I'm going to friend Henry, I'll friend Henry and you'll see it updates the list and keeps it uh, pretty clean for you. And then I've got my, uh, my Henry as a new friend. Uh, one of the things that I brought up in Backlog this week is I started to think about the high scores and um, the friends list is when we get to the point of the shop and I have to start implementing these constraints, um, what can I do to stop a player from just filling your, your pending games list and maybe exceeding the number of games that you're allowed to play when we add the constraint. Uh, I put a suggestion in the, so I, I issued it as backlog and I put a suggestion in there. I think it's worth uh, um, stroking my chin a little bit about it and thinking about it. But ultimately what I think I'm gonna end up doing is that once you challenge a player, if you already have a pending challenge that they have not yet accepted, I'm going to not allow you to challenge them again. You can't flood their inbox, so to speak, their, their pending games with challenges. Right now, this mechanic uh, is working in the completed game section. Um, just a couple, of, and I artificially built that because we don't have a way to, to complete a game yet. Um, so just a couple of the accounts, the Xander and the Evan account, I believe has some uh, completed games. POI probably has one. 
there that I've set up. So you can fully go in and test the ability to challenge an existing player, which would show up in pending. And rather than it saying pending, it would put both players' names there. So that's kind of where I'm going to go with that. Um, I might do that in a crunch time or in a future milestone, wire these up. Um, but I need to go back in and I'll, I'll use the completed feature to test out the fact that I'm making sure that you can't challenge someone if they've got a pending challenge that they haven't accepted. So, um, but basically putting in the friends and making sure that I can add them to my list and then I can manage my friends list and take them back out, um, was part of the, uh, backlog items we threw into milestone three this week. Um, the big items this week, we'll go down the issues list, is to develop the game scene. So we'll just go ahead and move in. I've got uh, a map test here. Um, this player, it's not his turn, so we have turn taking in there. So when we get to the iPhone, we'll dig in a little bit better there on those parts and pieces. Um, let, me, let me log out of here just to log in and show it. Uh, you'll notice that the password's preloading. Um, again, I'm moving a little bit closer to the final vision here of what the login score screen is going to look like. And uh, I'm not worried about changing the display name at this point. I'm just going to go into a game. So that's only relevant if I'm creating a game. So we'll go back into map test. So yeah, it's Xander's turn. So Xander's going to go in. And uh, this is the generated map. So it's got our forests and our trees, and it's got water. Um, this one generated an interesting bottleneck with a mountain range between the rivers, which I thought was interesting. Um, I ended up doing a change up from the, uh, from the defined issue, which I notated in the issue. Um, I had a lot more water and a lot larger clusters of these items, and it, uh, wow, it just looked really, really cluttered. So I just did a little refactor and I noted that uh, in the issue, dialed into what I felt was a, a really good mix of how much water, how much swamp, how much forest uh, would make the map identifiable. Um, this also solved another potential problem, and, and we'll see, I've got it in backlog, that these maps have a very distinctive overview. Now it's, it's tough to see that here, um, but as you get familiar enough with it, you'll you'll be able to identify it. And uh, because it has the patterns of rivers and mountains and stuff, my goal, one of the backlog issues is back at the game section, uh, was to, when you have your active games, to be able to identify one game from another, particularly if you're playing a lot of games with the same player. So what I'm thinking on doing is getting rid of the twin sword button for play and generating dynamically a mini map based on this map as an icon that resembles the rivers and stuff. So I figure as you're playing, you get pretty familiar with that pattern and that pattern I hope you identify which one of those games it is. So um, uh, just a, a revelation, you know, sort of spontaneous type of thing um, that popped up. But otherwise you can scan around, uh, you can tap your stuff. So on the screen we're showing castles, we're showing this icon is showing ownership. So you'll see it's a shield if it's neutral. And we'll scroll up here to the bad guys and um, let me tag him. And it's a skull if it's an enemy territory. Um, this is the resource value here. This is the current standing garrison. Uh, this is the income coming into it. Uh, so this particular player has already consumed the income and this is the resources that he's accumulated. So we are accumulating resources and we're accumulating um, turn values. So, and that's just an artifact of, of players playing on um, playing on two different devices. So, uh, but the good news is, is it's properly protecting against being able to recollect uh, those resources. So we'll see that when we get to the iPhone a little bit better. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and end my turn here. And I believe I logged in as Xander. So we're going to switch gears and I'm going to close out this app and go over here. I believe I've got it open already, maybe. There we go.
uh, go into here. I logged into Xander on the other one, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. So now we're talking about the iPhone's implementation of the, hey, do you want to use your microphone? One of the things I liked about this particularly is that I can stub into this. So it can report back to me and it can stall my application waiting for an answer. What I don't like about the iPhone is the second I hit don't allow, you're done. It won't, it won't allow me to prompt again uh, unless I go into the app settings and turn it back on. So there is no nifty checkbox like Android has that would give me a clue to prompt over and over again. I kind of understand Apple's decision that, you know, someone requesting permission over and over and over again because this is a modal dialogue um, could end up becoming an abuse point. But um, it's one of those things, if I'm a player and I'm not paying attention, I hit don't allow, you know, I'm, I'm stuck at the login screen. So I'm going to go ahead and allow it. Um, and go on in and if you've got an iPhone you can play with it you just have to go in the settings and turn it on manually it won't prompt again and um, same thing so I'm now logged in this is my friend list and all the lists dynamically pop up these icons to let me know whether or not they're my friends or not and uh, so like Hearthdale 1 and then I can go over here and I'll see Hearthdale 1 pop up or I can say nah I don't want to be his friend anymore and he goes away and if I go back into my active it pops back up on him alright so those are the two backlog items so let's go through the Milestone 3's original uh, stuff so Evan's gonna log in and play his turn and you'll see down here you can't see my finger but the bag with the arrows going into it to the right of that's the number 10 that's the number of resources that I collected this turn so if I uh, come up here to my castle this is my castle and as you can see from the two coins and the 10 to the right of it that's its resource value um, right now we don't have conquest in this milestone but uh, if we could conquer more or, or less uh, hexes you would see these resource values accumulate and you would see the income value which is the bag with the arrows I've added a backlog item to give the user the ability to press down on one of these icons and pop up a hint to tell them hey what is this icon what is this icon what is this icon so through a backlog maybe it's something I can get done during crunch time or what have you um, but the the generation of the map is randomly generated we'll see how that works through code in fact I'll go ahead and just create a new game and get one started logging in and out so you can see a different map generate um, we're uh, accumulating resources on the entrance of the turn so if I were to basically take and swipe whoopsie swipe this and then load back into it right and we'll let this log in you'll notice that it looked like it did on the Android it's detected that that guy already took his turn so I'm gonna log in ah yeah yeah I'm supposed to log in myself again <laughs> sorry getting confused um, map quest here we go and you'll see now that the bag with the air is going at zero so it's you've already collected you can't swipe the app away and then come in and collect and collect and collect and collect uh, but if I end my turn Xander takes his turn then I come back and take my turn then my mount will go up to 50 so for this week uh, on the issues develop the game scene so we've got that we've got our map uh, we've got our panel here that's able to display and show various informations uh, very similar to what we see on the main menu this panel will flip um, we're going to come up with a more interesting way to display some of these numbers but for now um, the, the progress bar is a good idea but my concern is is while we're developing this if I can't see the numbers under it um, while visually it's more impressive it's not going to give me a, a really good way to test it um, let's see on the on entry of the game for the player's turn which is issue 2881 uh, we saw that it accumulated resources or gave you resources based on controlled territory in this case my castle uh, map navigation so I can scroll around and move the, the map uh, around and tag pieces see what their garrison is see what their ownership is what the resource value is and I'm able to constantly see what my total resources are that are available to me uh, let's see map navigation we'll get that creating an 8 by 8 map we'll do that next allow adding and removing of friends we just shall saw that and during login um, prompt for the microphone so we got those pieces in so I'm gonna go ahead and end my turn we're gonna start a new game here 
Milestone 3, Map Generation Test. Milestone 3, Map Generation Test. All right, and I've got... Creating a new game. Milestone 3, Map Generation Test. Okay, so this is an open game. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swipe this away and try to log in at Xander. And just to give it some uniqueness, I'm going to call it X-Man. And it'll be end of the open games. Milestone 3, Map Generation Test. Okay. And I'm going to have Xander go ahead and accept it. X-Man accepting of Map Generation Test. X-Man accepting of Map Generation Test. Okay, so that should be in my active games. There's X-Man, and I get to go first. How handy. All right, so I'm going to come into here, and as you can see, the map's a little bit different. Um, we have opponents on 4x8 and 5x1. So this guy's got a little bit of some private territory guarded by water. Um, so he's basically got one, two, three. So he's got four sectors that would require the player to go into the castle to get. So that's fairly fortunate. Um, but this player has some slightly uh, better access to mountains and forests. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's the map that's given, right? So I, I can get four resource points that I know can never be taken away, uh, but I have to move quite far before I can get to my first higher resource value target. Um, this guy's got a lot of his resources there. Looking for my cluster of forests. There we go. So here's my forest. There's probably one stuck down here somewhere. Yep, there it is. Two and three. Perfect. So, um, again, in the issue, I updated um, how I adjusted how much of what appears. So, in this case, it looks like all the water uh, generated up there at the top, but still makes for a, an interesting and kind of dynamic gameplay. So, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. That, I believe, is Milestone 3. Uh, let's recap. We covered uh, the development of the game scene. We're in that right now. We have uh, shown that we can generate resources on the player's turn. So you can see here I'm generating uh, 10 points from my capital, and I have a resource total of 10 points. Uh, resource points, uh, one denoted by the bag with arrows and the other denoted by a stack of coins. Um, map navigation, so I'm able to move around the net map and actually tap on various items and pull up information about them. Um, the, the creation of the 8x8 map with terrain is done. Um, we are allowing them to add and remove friends, so the friends piece is functional, and during log on we're sort of priming the pump on the microphone to make sure that that doesn't uh, impact mechanics in the game. So that's Milestone, Milestone 3 in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed it. Now let's take a look at the code. Hello, my name is Evan Schwartz, and we're going to now take a look at the code and the project for Battlecry and go over uh, Milestone 3 and what it is that we put together this week. So one of the Milestone 3 uh, backlog or uh, out-of-process pieces was regarding the microphone, uh, the ability on login to go ahead and uh, establish uh, permission to use the microphone. So on our main login screen, you can see here, uh, on our main Canvas object, we have our, our logon script. And in our login script is where we have uh, put all of this code. So um, let's microphone check. So basically, we have an enumerator here for micro microphone check. And uh, when they try to do log on, it goes to show message and starts the code of microphone check. So this is where it kicks in uh, before we actually went right into the load player. Uh, microphone check comes in here. This is using, this is sort of the higher benefits that I found for uh, 
the iPhone or the iOS operating system is that Unity allows you to basically do a, a yield return and request authorization for a microphone which means that this line will sit and wait and then once the user uh, answers the prompt question um, this gives you that answer and then you can react appropriately uh, this is not yet supported on the Android at least not through the uh, Unity API so we end up blowing through this piece and Android only prompts when you begin to access the microphone um, so in this case what I'm doing is I'm accessing the microphone waiting a second and then making sure I get a recording out of it um, so what we were seeing when we were seeing the Android's prompt for this, whether it was denied or uh, allowed, uh, if they hit allow, unfortunately, I've accessed the microphone, waited my second, and guess what? I don't see anything coming back from my recording, uh, so I have to assume that they denied it. Um, and I just didn't, I couldn't find a better way to do it. Um, so in this case, if they allow it, um, I'm still going to blow through it. It'll just go away and they can log in again and it'll get them in the door. So that was about the, the best user experience I could come up with. Um, the one thing I did like about the Android is it continued to prompt, um, over and over again as they were logging in and the whole point is is not to allow the player to get past the login screen uh, unless the application has permissions to the microphone but anyway um, this is basically that chunk of code after which success goes ahead and uh, loads the player and goes into the game and that was essentially um, the issue 2908 all right, so the next one we're going to look at is adding and removing friends. And so that happens in the main scene. Let's zoom that up here. Give this a little more space, apparently. And uh, we'll do the battle panel. Go into the active games panel, scroll, viewport, and get into our data item. And just turn that on so we can look at it. So we've added these buttons here. Um, this is similar from last week. Uh, when you get to the active game piece, we're, we're wiring up the accept button, challenger, friend button, so that we have references to them. But all the on clicks and all of that stuff for the buttons are done in code. So if you look, we don't have anything wired up here inside their button event. And uh, essentially that's on the set active data item. Um, the, this is on every list. This includes friends. This includes the high scores. This includes, but they all use pretty much the same boilerplate piece. So we'll take a look at that. And uh, let's go up into, I'm going to move this over here. So we're moving these parts and pieces. And again, as you saw last week, there's the loading script that loads and manages the list, and then there's the item script that holds a little bit of data about itself. So in the loading script, as we've done the callback and come back, um, we've added these extra little pieces here in our current player object. We're now tracking, hey, is this guy a friend? Um, if he is a friend, then let's go ahead and turn this on. And if he isn't, then let's turn this off. Right. So let's take a look at our current player. So this is our friend. We've got our friends object and we have the ability to add friends. We've moved and localized all of our friend maintenance into our current player object as this goes on. So we're using the same concept here is that we're, we're taking the the player data, we're serializing it into XML, and that's just going to stay in the device info field for the player record uh, down in the database. So that's just our blob of XML it allows us to basically be a state bag for this player, where we can add and pull things in, and then we serialize them uh, to proper, uh, you know, basic classes. I'll show you that. Um, let's get up to our friends. So here's our player data. Uh, serializable class and then here's our friend so it, as we get through this there's going to be a you know uh, purchases will be this it'll just keep track of what our purchases are or it'll just become a first class since right now our purchases are just uh, you know how many games you can play maybe it's a first class uh, property 
of the player data that we serialize and just store into XML and can recall as we need to. So we just built some static methods onto the serializable classes so they could, you know, turn it to and from XML that goes down to the database. Um, the big benefit there is because I can, again, a lot of these decisions was single guy trying to do all this stuff. So I'm looking for ways to be force multiplier. How can I tinker around with uh, schema here at the UI level uh, for storage of data, but still be able to utilize it in proper queries down the database. And XML gives me that ability to do that. Um, same thing when we get into the player game movement, we're doing the same construct here is uh, we're calling them barbarian so it's what stage are they at are they in the collect stage main stage this is how we're tracking whether or not the player should collect resources um, this is their total resources and their total income and that's really all we're kind of tracking on the barbarian right now but you can you know we're going to be adding heroes to this and buffs and all kinds of things to expand uh, this this object out with xml as we need to down the road all right, so back to this. Um, so we're, we're passing in our reference objects there and we're deciding based on our current player object, uh, is the aggressor, uh, is that a friend? Um, you know, if it is, let's turn off the thing. You know, if, it, if it's me, let's turn it off. I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna friend myself and same thing for a challenger. So that's what controls the visibility of the buttons. And then as far as the click, we add their listeners here. So each one of the items has their own uh, ability to add and remove from friends. So if we look at that and we come to the actual item itself, add aggressor to friends, as you can see, we've encapsulated this into the uh, current player object. And we're just passing in the aggressor to me as a friend if I'm the current player. And then at that point, uh, there's no reason to have the button on anymore. And because I uh, basically added him as a friend, I want to refresh the list in case he's anywhere else in the list. We don't want those buttons to show up either. So we just call back to the uh, load active items object and ask it to, hey, would you mind reloading your list? So that happens on each button press and the same thing for the challenger. Right. So if we come back over to the current player and look at add friends, uh, we're creating a new friend object. We're setting the ID in it. That's all this really is. Uh, we're adding it to our PD record, which is our player data record for friends, uh, which is a list. And we're serializing that into player XML and then we save the player. And right now, uh, we've got saving and loading of the player, so it manages all of our player prefs, and uh, it also manages our API call to save the player, which just does a basic uh, save callback. Um, we can wire up some additional handlers to this. I've got this as a little to-do here, um, just for better error handling, but because this is a non-visual component, right now it doesn't have anything that uh, interacts with the UI but it probably should. So that's just a matter of adding a reference to a, um, a patented pop-up. Okay, so that's um, essentially, we're gonna see the same behavior uh, over and over again, you know, except for the unfriending. Uh, here I've got my unfriend button, and for my uh, unfriend call to action, I go to my uh, set friends, and uh, unfriend, unfriend, dial up. So that basically calls the pop-up. Uh, the pop-up said that to default if they say yes, and then I call my current player general uh, object. I unfriend it. Uh, this is me that I'm trying to remove, or not me, but this is the player associated with that item that I'm trying to remove as a friend. And then it's doing the on move callback. That's important here just so that I can time the refresh list. Uh, otherwise, this all happens in separate threads and it removes them and I don't really notice that it's updating or not updating and it updates the list too quickly and I hadn't quite removed it yet. So this sort of gives me the ability to time those threads and make sure that uh, I only do a refresh after the callback. Um, and just as a bit of contrast, the reason why we don't have to do that on our loaded items, our set active items, is because we are hiding that specific button and what we're asking it to do is to refresh the active games um, essentially 
after the fact because it's all on resident data. I have a copy of my friends here and I can easily remove them when I refresh the list because I'm, I'm referencing resident data. So I don't have to do that there. But when I'm removing them out of the list on the, uh, the friends list since that's being pulled directly from the database uh, as an XML path subquery, I need to make sure that I time it. And it's the same thing for the, the high scores. Same thing, same scenario with the high scores needs a, needs a particular callback. All right, so that's our adding and allowing friends. We talked about the, uh, um, the microphone priming. So let's take a look at the map creation. And uh, I've added the map creation stuff to my API. So we'll take a look at each one of these parts and pieces. Um, so I have a XML based map just for convenience and storage and again the reason why I like that is because it's flexible and one of the stretch goals I have further down once we've gotten everything in and playing is is an 8x8 map good is, maybe should I go 16 by 16 uh, maybe it should be a very organic map where pieces know where the other piece is and it's not just a square board so I wanted to keep the map just Here's a variety of sectors. Uh, they have XY coordinates, but they can have other properties as well. Uh, we'll open each one of these. This is being able to assign a specific hex, uh, all of its metadata, you know, infantry, archeries, resource, terrain type. Um, this is basically clustering hex. Right now, the only thing I'm using a flow for is water, so I just named it as such, flow water. Uh, we've got our add. Add cluster. So here, here's the meat and potatoes of it for the create game, and these are all my little helper methods. So as it goes in through the XML data record, um, this is just a helper record to you know extract the fact that I'm not trying to set up XML nodes, sub nodes, and all that junk. Um, I can basically just use a, a value name key pair type of syntax, and it just makes it easier mentally uh, to track it. So as I'm going through, I've got my map, which is 8x8. I'm storing my x and y coordinates as uh, parameter-based uh, XML data within an XML rec. So the schema for the XML is XML data, rec, and then parameters. Uh, so in the first one, I'm basically passing my map in and getting my map back out to set up my castle. Um, I'm setting up my aggressor castle on 4.1. I'm setting up my challenger castles on 5.8. And that gives them kind of like a counter proposal, very much like on a chessboard with, you know, chess pieces. And um, then else, I'm cr basically filling my map with planes, right? So here's my castles and everything else is planes. And that, that essentially is going to just stub out my map. Um, because I've got an add record here, I have to move a record, right? It leaves one at this, the last loop. So then I basically am adding my water, and then I'm adding my clustered forest, clustered mountains, and clustered swamps. These are the values I'm assigning to them. Forest value 3, mountains 5, swamp 0, waters nothing as well, and plains have a value of 1. So let's just take a look at the add water. So what I came down to is originally I had said that we were going to do 10 waters, and it just it, it wasn't really working out with the water. So I bumped this back down uh, by 2. 8 seems to be a nice... Uh, uh, a good little sweet spot of how many waters are on there that isn't too much and doesn't you know block off too much or create too many bottlenecks. Um, then basically we enter this while loop while I'm going through my max water and uh, this is the I'm just randomly finding a go out on the map and find a spot right and then because uh, my map is XML it's not an actual X and Y grid um, get me that record for that particular map item and that's what this little handy dandy function does is it, it iterates over all the records and finds the XNL match and then sets the map to that record and then returns uh, that map record as, that, as an integer. So the first thing it does is it wants to make sure that I'm picking up planes. So again, the entire map are 62 sectors minus castles are planes. Um, and since I've, I'm about to create one, this becomes a start. I deduct my max water and then I set that map location as a water you know it's water and then everything else is kind of zeroed out and I get my map back and then I will set an initial direction am I going up am I going down left right and then I will start my flow water so this is a recursive routine this is what kind of 
primes the pump on the recursive routine. So I'm passing my map, the XY location that I generated up here to tell me where I am, what direction am I going in, um, how many more waters do I want to make. So what I'm trying to do here is that in my master while loop, even though I want a maximum of eight, um, I create one, right, and then I want three more to flow from it in a particular direction. Um, so it'll go out a maximum of four, right, and then it'll it'll go up and down and around. It's I, I make it kind of windy, and you'll see that in the flow of water. And then once it creates three, it goes all the way back to the while, creates another random spot, grabs a record, makes sure it's planes, and then flows out again. So it's like it drops a point and spiders out, and spiders out, just to give it a more organic look. So when we look into the flow water, uh, we want to make sure when we come into this that max water is greater than zero and our count is greater than zero. And the count is this value we've passed into it. And then we come in and I'm like, okay, what is the direction? I'm up, down, left, and right, right? And um, as long as I'm not, you know, uh, off the map somehow with my counters, right? I didn't go off the map. Um, I get my record. I want to make sure that where my water is going is also a planes. And at that point, I deduct my count. I deduct my max water. I set the location I just deduced as a water item. I will go ahead and randomly deduce my direction again. So I, if it was last time it was right one, maybe it's up one, then to the left, one down. And then it calls the map and it recursively calls itself with its new direction and its reduced count and its reduced max water. And this sort of digs all the way down into itself until it has run out of count and then works its way all the way back up, passing map, passing map, passing map, until uh, it has completed what I'm asking it to do, which is essentially um, this process here. So when we look at the add clusters here, um, because I wanted my mountains to cluster and my forests to cluster and my swamps to cluster, um, I can make this a little bit more generic, right? And they're not gonna flow like a, a river, they're just gonna be in chunks. So in this case, it came out to that uh, clusters of six was, was a better uh, hit. Now again, same thing here as I'm going through, I'm making sure I'm within the map range, I get my record. I'm always wanting my next piece to be on a planes tile. So I'm eating up planes as I'm clustering it. So if any point during this deduction, I end up um, falling onto a hex that's not a planes, that ends that cluster and it starts again at the top of this wall and throws out a seed somewhere and begins a new cluster. So that's why you can get a really kind of dynamic look to it. Um, you may get where there's just one um, swamp and the very next hex it deduced, which is its neighbor hex, um, was a, a water or a mountain. And at that point, the process stops for that cluster. It comes out, whatever's left, and it goes back in through this while loop until it's done. So we'll look at how the cluster hex works. So in this case, as I'm clustering, I'm, I can go in all six directions, right, of my hex. Again, I'm making sure I don't go beyond the maximum terrain that was requested and the maximum count, and uh, make sure I'm on the board, and I make sure that I'm doing my terrain. I do my deductions. I set my map. So at this point here, I'm randomly filling these guys up with uh, garrison, you know, the neutral territories. Give me something to fight right away. And then once again, I... You know, I'm randomly moving in a direction as I'm trying to build this cluster, and then I cluster my hex again and recursively call itself. So that's kind of how the map is built. And again, these set uh, hex and find map, these are just some helper routines. And that ultimately gives me this nice little scenario here. So when I look at my cluster, uh, the numbers that are relevant. Um, at cluster, sorry, are this. So clusters worked really well in six, and water really worked well with eight, rather than the original ten. Uh, I click the wrong way. Yeah. Ten, and these were eight. That was just ended up being too much on an eight by eight board. And essentially, this is XML gets serialized, sent down to military. It, it's kind of done. Um, that takes care of our map navigation. So we'll come back into this, and uh, we'll now go into the game scene. Uh, I'm going to save, don't save that. 
and we've got our map. So one of our make sure our swipe logic was on there, our swipe detector, and this is our game controller that is housing all kinds of prefabs and little counters and all of our little text items and things of that nature. So as far as the uh, the ability to move around and detect a swipe, let's go ahead and edit the swipe logic detector. So this is one of the things that kind of broke this week. Um, in changing our scale uh, for our canvas, this piece where it's screen overlay, but we said scale with screen size and we gave it this size, that solved all of my other canvas problems. You guys have heard me rant and rave about that milestone after milestone. Unfortunately, that kind of nailed me here where um, before the way that my no uh, ray zone was calculating was based off the size of the panel trying to get to uh, screen coordinates so that I can make sure that when you're dragging your finger if it goes over the display panel at the bottom right that's this area here uh, and this open area appears the map area that if your finger were to scroll to this point it would stop that allows me to have button clicks and touches here without affecting my map even if my map goes beneath my panel it just stops the my ray cast from going beyond that point um, but once I change the scale factor um, my calculation was off and it took a little bit of uh, banging to realize that oh well there's your problem I'm in local scale now and now that I've set everything up uh, against my parent, this is local to my parent scale. I don't want that. I needed to uh, actually know where that panel is in comparison to the world so that I can get proper screen coordinates. So um, took a little time to figure out, but once I figured it out, it was just a, <laughs> what a huge change, but it uh, wasn't immediately obvious. Um, so at any rate, that... Uh, that allows us to detect our touch. So we, this is our ray cast. This no ray zone. So I'm talking to you like you know what you're talking about. This is our no ray zone, right? And in our no ray zone, we are uh, uh, calculating the no ray zone here, getting my coordinates based on uh, the rectangle that is passed into it, which is this guy up here. And all that's doing is saying, hey, you know, cast a ray, see if it hits. But if the in position of Y is greater than my no ray zone. In other words, if it goes below the map section and it goes into my panel, uh, let's not even consider it. Let's just not even bother doing any of the detect touch or anything of that nature. And it just falls right out of here. Uh, otherwise, it's calling my detect touch that the map itself can uh, react to and move the game object and transform it. And that's basically what this bad boy does, is as you're moving it around, it's, it's allowing you to drag the map. So that's the critical piece. And then on each one of the hex logics, da, 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 G, H, there we go. Um, here's where I can actually, you know, select sector is being managed and uh, turning the selector on and off. Let me get back to my swiper logic. And in my detect touch up here, if I do detect a touch and I've hit my, uh, my hex object, so at this point, give me the object that I hit. Uh, does it have hex logic in it? If so, let's call it selector, and that's how we're able to select and unselect a particular hex within the game. And then once that selection is turned on and off within the map, I, I in the game controller, I'm actually able to capture and set all of that stuff up and with a show hex. So let's uh, quickly kind of go through that. It's all the attack stuff. So it's active. Um, under the showing of the hex, where's my show hex? There we go. So as I show my hex, this is how I'm managing what you do or do not see on uh, the actual panel itself as it's updating this information onto the panel and then managing uh, visibility of objects as are necessary. So this is the display terrain object and display ownership and then these little helper methods turn on and off various objects that are necessary that are stacked and overlaid uh, within that panel to be able to manage it. And essentially uh, the set hex active is what is being called from the detect touch to show the hex at various locations and then sets the active off when uh, if you touch it again and it is already selected. So this allows you to basically identify and select and unselect it. Um, 
This is our loading of our barbarian and our saving our barbarian, and essentially all we're doing in the battle is we're making sure are you and the aggressor, are you the challenger, and this is the barbarian's details, again, and just a helper object that we deserialize uh, based on the aggressor details into the curve barbarian, and then we reverse the process. We serialize it back into XML, putting it into the battle so that it can be saved. Uh, process swipe data away. Yeah, so at this point, this is just capturing the screen coordinates and making sure that you're touching it, and the game controller is receiving those events and reacting to them so that you can tag and it's managing what is or is not displayed on the uh, on the uh, on the panel for the player when they go into it. Um, when we get in, let's manage our render map bah, 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 down here. All right, so at this point, as we're rendering the map, we're basically assigning ownership of various colors. And it's at this point we are grabbing the curve barbarian stage to know if you're in the collect stage or not. And we're doing all of our accumulation based on uh, ownership status for each one of the hex. So here's your total income, and then this would up your total resources. And at the end of this, we switch your barbarian to maintenance mode. Uh, we update your total income. We save the barbarian, which basically maps it back to the battle object. And then we save the game, which takes the battle object and sends it down to the middle tier. Uh, one of the tripping points this week, again, uh, at the middle tier, um, it was... Uh, Pretty obvious as we were going through. Uh, it was at the middle tier as I was uh, testing this out. Nice little arc tool. I like this tool. Um, but I was sending, you know, challenge details, and here's my little. Here's an example of the XML that gets sent out. Right? Um, and it wasn't saving. Uh, so I, I did my test at my SQL layer. The SQL layer, of course, if I pass in the proper XML, it saves. Um, and I'm, I have the data here. It failed at my middle tier. Man, man, oh, man. This is a great example of sometimes you just need to get up and walk away when you hit a problem. So, <laughs> And I did that. After about an hour of tinkering with it and not being able to see why uh, this was failing, uh, I just took a walk. And I can't... And, can't stress enough, sometimes it's worth just walking away. But uh, the A and the I were reversed in the middle tier. I literally took this, right? I took this cut and paste and put it right under that field to confirm that it was, it was typed properly. And they weren't, they were flipped, right? And my brain couldn't make sense of it. And I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it, walked away, came back and Sure as heck. <laughs> sure as heck, they were um, they were flipped. My mic shut off there for a sec. Okay, uh, so that was one of the little challenges on being able to save down the challenger stuff. But once we got past that, the rest of the piping seemed to work really well. Um, where are we at? Uh, so we talked about adding and allowing moving friends. Uh, the attempt to access the microphone. The eight by eight uh, map generation. Uh, map navigation on entry of the game, collecting the player's revenue and keeping up with that. So that's this is how we're doing this, is a collect versus maintenance stage uh, that the barbarians maintain. And all that stuff gets sent back. And then on the last place is developing the game scene, which essentially is this entire game scene here. Critical to it was making sure that I had my swipe logic, swipe detector, game controller, API access and current player on my map object, which you can see is empty. Um, worked on a lot of my prefabs, as you can see from the screencast demo. So I've got my trees and a castle, so the, the hexes are starting to evolve a little bit. Um, there may be an opportunity to even beef those up even more, maybe add some animation to them. Um, but right now I don't seem to be having too much of a negative impact from my devices. Uh, everything seems to be processing fairly quickly and good enough, so I'm not overtaxing them. I'm happy about that. Um, the code pieces are coming together quite well. Didn't have to touch the database schema again this week, so that's really starting to feel pretty solid. Uh, the mechanism for storing uh, game details and player details has all been piped out. Uh, so I think we're, we're pretty strong. I'm loading my backlog items into backlog. So um, I've got quite a few. I've got my SQL job, game identification. I came up with an idea of 
basically creating a mini map version of the map to replace the sword buttons uh, to give that user that uh, that identification of what's going on uh, or who's which game is which specifically. Um, the the ability to enable challenging of friends is in my backlog. I came up with a suggestion on that is to not allow you to send a challenge uh, to a friend if they haven't accepted the first one. I think that's going to work out. I just want to run some models on it. Uh, add the press hover context menu on some of the icons so that we can start to identify what those mean. I'm actually expanding the circle of people I'm starting to put this into. I'm going to try to set up my, uh, my iPhone developer site uh, maybe during one of the crunch time weeks if I've got some extra time so I can start to just ship this stuff out to them. And then map selection details, uh, I realized as I was playing this week, <laughs> nowhere does it show the player's names of who owns what, where. So as I was playing with it, I was losing identity between the neutral player and the human player I'm playing. So I want to recapture that. So that's definitely going to get thrown into uh, the next milestone or maybe this, this crunch week as I have an opportunity to play with it. So all in all, um, as far as uh, bumps in the road, uh, the... The dyslexia around the A and I in the military, uh, middle tier was painful. Um, my entire Android environment uh, went into the crapper this week on a false error message from uh, Unity. So what had happened, I'll jump to the end, is the Android device I've been using uh, became full. I was throwing a bunch of different builds onto it, and I filled it up. The message I got back from Unity is, hey, your SDK, your Android SDK or Java must be corrupt. You need to install it properly. And that's what showed up here in my little um, uh, console display. So ultimately, after tinkering around, reinstalling Android Studio, going through that whole rig and row and resetting all of that stuff up, blowing through all of my player settings and having to reestablish those for my Android, um, I had uh, ultimately came to the conclusion that I couldn't get anything to work. No matter what I did, it didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. Um, so in that error message for the Android was also the exact command that they were executing against the uh, the ADS to install it. So I just copied that and ran it in a terminal window. I don't know if I still have it open. Yeah, excellent, I do. So this was the exact command, and I ran this, right? And it, it gave me this. Well, that was very helpful. I wish Unity surfaced that up. That would have saved me a significant amount of time. Because, of course, once I realized, oh, I, I'm out of space on my Android. Well, how embarrassing. That was, that's three hours of my life. I'll, I'll never get this back. And, unfortunately, that, that happened really today, prepping for this video. Uh, so, nothing like having catastrophic failure right at the last hour, right? Very typical of an install project is, uh, or a development project is to have it completely fall apart right before you're delivering it to a customer. Um, so the, the goal here was to, you know, or the, the lesson learned, didn't panic, that was good, went through a series of steps to try to dial into it, but uh, if, if Unity is giving you the exact command they're running, you might want to run it, because uh, if it comes to Android, the error messages that they serve is probably not going to be very useful, uh, just get it right off the command line. Other than that, uh, that's the end of Milestone 3. Um, things look like they're progressing pretty well. I'm very pleased with where we're at, and I'm looking forward to the next milestone. Thank you.